Hi, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good night, wherever you are all over the world. Thank you all for being here with us. Uh, my name is Sam. And on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for our virtual event with Amru Al-Qadi and Mona El Tahawi here to discuss Amru's memoir, Life as a Unicorn, A Journey from Shame to Pride and Everything in Between. We are so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community and now a global community during this uncertain time. So this is pretty amazing. Um, we'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website at booksoup.com or on our social media at booksoup. Our next event is actually next Tuesday, June 23rd at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time with Nika Ray and Peter Trachenberg to discuss her book, Ray by Ray. So for regular updates on upcoming events, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Um, this evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A. And to submit a question, you can please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, you can click the Like button, and they bump up that way. And we'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, please consider supporting our bookstore and our authors by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, which you can see at the bottom of the screen as well. It is that lovely green button that says purchase Amru's book here and that'll take you to our website and you can continue from there and it clicks outside of the screen if you want to purchase during the event um it won't it won't close you out so let me introduce our guest speakers for this evening Amru Al-Qadi is the founder of Drag Troop Denim and wrote the finale for Kumail Nanjani and Emily V. Gordon's series for Apple in U.S. Little America, as well as an episode for BBC America's hotly anticipated series, The Watch, based on the Discworld novels of Sir Terry Pratchett. Amru has two original TV series in development, one with Big Talk Productions and the other with Playground Entertainment. Their solo drag show, Glamru, from Quran to Queen, premieres this year at the Soho Theatre and then at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. That's exciting, congratulations. Amru has written and directed four short films that focus on the intersection of queer identity and race and has features in development with Film 4 and BBC Films. Their journalism has appeared in The Guardian, Independent, Gay Times, Attitude, CNN, and Little White Lies, among other publications. Unicorn is Amru's first book. Mona El Tahawi is a feminist author, commentator, and disruptor of patriarchy. Her first book, Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution, came out in 2015, targeted patriarchy in the Middle East and North Africa, and her second, The Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls in 2019, took her disruption worldwide. Her commentary has appeared in media around the world, and she makes video essays as feminist giant. We are so excited in this Pride Month to have these two amazing people with us tonight, and I cannot wait to hear this conversation. So without further ado, I will turn the camera over to Amru and Mona and sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Oh, thank you so much for having us. Hi, Mona. I'm so happy to be talking to you. Hello, Amr. I have so long wanted to meet you, and it <laughs> took a fucking pandemic to bring us here. <laughs> and before we jump in, I want to say hello to everybody from all over the world. I'm seeing people from Egypt, New York, Wisconsin, LA, San Francisco, Ontario, all over the fucking world. Welcome. And I begin everything as I always do. This is Mona Tahawi. And as always, fuck the patriarchy. My pronouns are she, her. And I am so fucking excited to be in conversation with the wonderful, glamorous, joyful, glorious, Glamru, Glamru themselves. How are you? I'm, I'm really good. I'm. It's midnight here in the UK, but I literally feel so um, energized to be talking to you. I've been a huge fan of your work for so so long, and um, thank you so much for doing this. Hello, everyone. My pronouns are they them. Um, um, I'm a queer Iraqi non-binary unicorn here to revel in the complexity and chaos of intersectional madness. Love it. Thank you for that. And before we get into the, the depths of all of this and take apart and put back together intersectionality, I want to start, Amr, by acknowledging uh, what happened last weekend when queer feminist activist Sarah Hegazi died by suicide. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure that many people who are joining us today know of Sara and are celebrating and honoring Sara's life, but also fe feeling a great deal of pain and sadness. 
And so I want to take this moment to honor her, um, to talk about her for a while, because this is a very painful moment. And I wondered if you had anything to say, Amr, because I'm especially thinking of young queer people who are at home right now, unable to express grief, unable to explain that they're sad and they're hurting and they're enraged and they're grieving. And I want you all to know that you are not alone. We mm. are here for you. You are not alone. And I wondered if you wanted to say something, Amr. Yeah, I mean, it is an incredibly devastating story and a really powerful response. I think what I felt from her final note was that the world felt too cruel for her to stay in it. Um, and it made me really weep for all the because it made me think of what I felt at 14, 13, when I was much younger, you know, I thought the world is irreparably cruel. I will only see harm wherever I go because of my queer identity. And it takes knowing that kindness is out there to keep you going, even through a really hard patch. I was lucky enough to have a few glimmers of hope in my childhood and in my teenage years, which made me think as terrible as it's getting now and as abusive as my household was getting there are these glimmers of hope and eventually I will get there and you get the impression I think that Sarah felt why is there no kindness and it makes me think of queer people and how even queer people can sometimes be cruel to each other because we've had so much cruelty happening to us that we kind of project it onto each other and it made me really yearn for a community based just on empathy and getting rid of hierarchy you know i was thinking of even gay communities which are so hierarchical you know mm -hmm. white cisgender men seem to get everything and, and i thought enough of that we need a community where kindness is key um and i just want all queer people of queer Arabs and queer Muslims who are feeling incredibly scared right now to know that eventually there is going to be kindness out there. You just have to trust that it will happen. Yes, beautifully said, Amra, thank you. And I think that you represent that and this wonderful book that we are here to discuss oh, now. Right. I have the, the UK edition, which was called Unicorn. The <laughs> edition published in the US is Life as a Unicorn. And as I was reading your book, I was thinking, God, this is so fantastic because there's going to be a young queer Arab or a young queer Muslim who will pick this book up and see themselves reflected in the way that you talk. You write so beautifully about the first time you put drag on and you saw your true self reflected. And I, I give me goosebumps, you know, oh, to see you. yourself reflected, to see yourself acknowledged. So congratulations, Alf Mabruk, for this beautiful book that said so wonderfully, I am here. So tell me, what made you think, you know what? I'm gonna write a fucking book. The world needs to know my story. <laughs> um, you know, there were a couple of thought processes. The first being was in the UK where I am based and where I initially kind of have a profile was, I was writing a lot of journalism for many different publications um, liberal publications, but what I was finding really frustrating was the fact that these white liberal publications that wanted to seem progressive were only ever bringing me in to write a kind of 600 word think piece on why terrorism is bad or why conversion therapy is bad. And I was never able to really, once in a blue moon I was, but I was never really able to write about the contradictions of my belief systems. Because, you know, they never wanted me to write my honest opinion on Islam, because I have conflicting opinions on Islam, mm -hmm. some great, mm -hmm. some critical. But then mm -hmm. it was, you know, and I became, I found this sort of tokenistic journalist who was only ever being invited in to debate um, my identity, rather than just to discuss my view of the world or to discuss my experiences. And I found that what was happening over a couple of years of doing this was, I was reading like through my, my articles one day and I was like, I just sound like 
this really angry victim going, I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. Because that was the only format. And I was getting invited on TV a lot to debate someone who doesn't believe in trans people or debate someone who thinks Islam's the plague of the world or whatever. And it's like, if you're always inviting me to debate, I'll only ever be reacting to a narrative that that's bullshit anyway. So I was like, said to my, you know, my agent, I was like, I just kind of want to write I want to write a political book that doesn't engage in any political discussion so that I can just write about my experiences authentically without having to debate them with anybody so that whoever picks this book up can understand the complexity and intersectionality of of a life like mine so that we're not just these 2D kind of... Um, puppets for the liberals kind of thing so that was like initially number like number one but i think for me as well i really was carrying like a lot of the weight of some of the experiences that happened to me and they were a bit too close to me i think it was like a hand on my face at one point i couldn't quite see what i felt about my mother who is the central character of, of the book in a way, um, besides me, obviously, but, um, you know, <laughs> but we were, you know, she's a woman who essentially taught me to be a drag queen because like many Arab women, she's like a queen, yet she's obviously anti-gay. And I didn't really know what I felt about her. And I thought if I can just treat my life almost like a novel, I'll be able to get some clarity. But then the third thing really is what, you know, what you said was like, I'm going to take up space and I'm just one life, but here's 80,000 words about, about my life in a world that has made me try to feel so small, like you can't ignore this kind of thing. And I think it's that my, one of my drag mentors taught me this about taking up space. You know, one of the first exercises that, that I do now when I teach drag is walk as slowly as possible from one side of the room to the to the rest and we'll have a race and the person who gets their last wins because you're feeling <laughs> you're, you're feeling yourself so much that every step is an event and that's what i wanted to do with this i wanted to just make an event <laughs> like of, of of my experiences because they replicated by millions all over the world i'm sure yeah and, and what a beautiful, joyous event it is to, to read the book. And, and you know, it, it just struck me now listening to you and the reasons um, why you were inspired to write this beautiful book, that there are very few instances I can think of where um, a woman of Egyptian and Muslim descent who identifies as queer, because I do identify as queer now and I can talk about it later, but I wanna focus on you. So an, a, a woman of Egyptian Muslim descent who identifies as queer is in conversation with a, a, a person, a non-binary person of Iraqi, British and Muslim descent, who is also a drag queen, who is also queer, and no, there's no white person in between. There's no <laughs> whiteness as the default. There, there's no, um, heteronormativity as the default. It's the two of us. And I'm mm. like, wow, how rare is this space? And mm. it's rare because we've never been allowed to be complicated. And this is what I love about you. You're complicated. I mean, there's a passage in the introduction to your book in which you say, I'm too Iraqi for the gays. I'm too gay for the Iraqis. I'm too this, I'm too that. Because all of you in your complicated glory was too much. And yet here we are in these two little boxes <laughs> going, fuck you all, because we are taking space and we are complicating the narrative. Mm. How important is complicating the narrative? Mm, that's a really beautifully put. Um, how important is complicating the narrative? I think it's, um, I think it's really critical actually, because I think the opposite of a complicated narrative is a reified one. Mm -hmm. And when you reify something, that's just sort of one inch away from a stereotype or a, or a kind of reductive impression. And, you know, I work a lot in TV and film and 
you know, I've played about 20 terrorists on screen myself. I've been invited to audition for about 20 terrorists on screen. And I think when, um, so I can give an example, like when I was pitching a TV show about an Arab woman who is very much a drag queen living with her drag queen child, the white commissioner was really pushing for her to be abusive so that, so mm. that, his queerness or the or their queerness would have a real sort of um conflict with their Muslim heritage. And I said, no, no, no. The complication is is this character is trying to be a drag queen through their heritage because it's more drag than British culture, which is shepherd's pie and con you know, constipation. I mean, what is British culture, right? And <laughs> so like, so um but that wasn't was a really and i and actually it stopped it getting commissioned in the end because it was a really reductive you know they just thought well islam is bad for gays and this character is queer so surely it's a sort of queer against islam queerness wins big drag show and it's like well no that's your reductive eurocentric um version where you've pitched islam as the evil where you've not acknowledged any colonial history of exporting homophobia mm -hmm. to the Middle East or any of that and you're the winner and actually the story that I just tried to tell you is actually a character who's trying to do the opposite who's trying to come out through their Arab identity and the reason that this person just said I don't get it is because there's been no story there's no template yeah. so their reductive quite Islamophobic interpretation of what I was trying to say you know really wasn't their fault entirely because the only thing they've seen is, I mean, what have they seen? I don't know. United 93, the film about 9-11. Like, what what do they know? Yeah. Um, so, so that complication of the narrative is really key. And actually, I think so, so many times with, with our kind of stories and, and, you know, a voice like yours is people expect you to provide some kind of resolution of you know so I, i'm sure you'll get this a lot you might talk about progressive um arab women or f arab feminism or and a white person will go but what about the hijab or what about um what about the fact that in saudi they stone people what's the resolution and you're like it's a lot more complicated than that yeah i have none of the answers i'm just yeah. gonna we're just digging at the moment aren't we yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in 2009, because your conversation reminds me as well of um, the very first time that I attended an event for openly, openly queer Arabs. It was when I first visited Beirut in 2009. And on my first evening there, I went to the launch of a book called Barid Mistajil, which for those who don't speak Arabic means express mail. And it was a collection of oral narratives of lesbian, bisexual, uh, and trans women, and, and the questioning people in Lebanon. And the beautiful thing about this book was, they, it collected voices from across the country that, I've just got to plug in my computer here before it all goes off. Um, it collected voices of Lebanese uh, queer people from across the country. Uh, so basically, lesbian, bisexual women, like I said, or trans women, and of different sex and different, um, uh, backgrounds, different, you know, working class, upper class, all of that. And of course, it, it, the, you know, the, the people who were interviewed talked about homophobia and how difficult it is to come out. But they also then talked, and this is where I think you and I come in as well with this complication, about how when they did, you know, quote unquote, flee to the so-called West or, you know, seek asylum um, abroad, it didn't end, freedom didn't suddenly come because they might have left homophobia back home, but then wherever they went, be it Canada or the US or the UK or somewhere else, there was now anti-Arab discrimination, there was Islamophobia, there was the difficulties of living as refugees in asylum, which I think this is what makes Sarah's story especially poignant, you know, because 
even though she wasn't in Egypt anymore, you know, she still, she longed for her family. She was struggling as an asylum seeker. She was struggling with, I didn't know her personally, but I know from other asylum seekers, especially those who are queer, who they're not white and queer. And the queer world in many so-called Western countries is so dominated by white and cis voices, you know? So you're basically kind of like, it's this yo-yo between discriminations. And it's like this space of kindness that you talked about, where is this space of kindness mm. for someone who wants a home? You know, that is something, you know, I'll be asking myself forever, I think. But I think, you know, you hit on a, a really important point. And it's definitely something I try and explore in the book, which is, I think, a really um, dangerous thing that can happen is especially from maybe for queer people in the MENA region who are leaving which is you know what I did or Sarah did is there's this expectation that your sexual identity is um, something that's permitted by whiteness or western identity so the kind of um, the kind of condition of your being allowed to be queer is you should assimilate a little bit because the West has guaranteed you the right to be queer. And then what you, what I experienced very much is is a you know when in, as a teenager because my home in particular had been so um, really traumatic and I I just sadly had a very negative experience with one Islam teacher who was very sort of hell 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 you know from the age of six seven so vivid that for me it was like islam gay not gonna work and so i came, told my parents oh i'm white now when i was 14 you know i quit speaking arabic i um i i i got a scholarship to a very british boarding school and and wanted to literally be white and because i thought well that's the only way i'm gonna be um happily gay and actually mm -hmm. that did much more damage mm -hmm. to my mental health and my identity than what I had experienced before. Because you don't stop missing your family or your culture or your language or your heritage or any of that just because you're able to come out. Like you can't, it's, it's, a, it's a huge compromise and you shouldn't have to compromise. I mean, unfortunately the circumstance, especially when you're young, they feel that way. For me, a, mo a moment, there, there have been moments where I felt the home. Mm. One most particularly was in 2018 at this event in London called Black Pride, which is like mm. sort of the, the day after Pride, but it's centering people of colour. And um, I was still quite high from the day before and was just sit, sat with some friends and I was like, what is that? And I heard this Om Kalthum song, you know, the Egyptian just queen mm. of the Middle East. And I was like, that can't be right. Like, am I mm -hmm. hallucinating still from yesterday? Because I was kind of out of it. And no, someone was like, no, I'm hearing that too. So we followed the sound and there was a, a, a tent by these people called Pride of Arabia, um, which is for queer Arabs in the UK. And it was listening to the Um Kulthum song that I was, I was obsessed with as a child, but was never able to express myself in because of what my household was like. But as an out queer adult with trans and queer Arabs all around me, dancing to a song from my heritage as a queer adult, that I felt at home for a second. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for people like us, you know home is just ephemeral moments you know this right now feels a bit like home for me mm -hmm. um and it doesn't feel as stable and i think obviously like we are all craving stability and stuff and but actually there's a kind of magical quality to the fact that home is maybe a little bit rarer but when it does arrive momentarily at least it's not you know friday night with the kids watching telly it's with like mm -hmm. iconic um people family in a way and i do feel that i mean i'm very spiritual and still quite religious sometimes in a way so 
there is a there's a real spirituality for me in in that and you know we've met online but we've been talking for a really long time and that mm. is like a kinship that is mm. made possible by our backgrounds and our, our so so i'd say maybe reframing my idea of what home means has mm. made me feel i don't know what you feel in terms of like where you feel most sort of cohesive mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I'm so glad you mentioned Om Kalsum because I was going to come to her eventually, of course, because you know how much I love her and mm. I know how much you love her. And I think she ties in perfectly with um, our insistence that we don't need whiteness and we don't need the so-called West, which, as we know, with its colonial history, with its imperial history, imposed a great deal of homophobia on, on cultures that were not intrinsically or did not have indigenous to them um, homophobia, like India, like so many former colonies that are now, you know, tr fighting really hard to decriminalize things mm. that were put to their legal system by these um, moralistic Victorian Christian white people who arrived, you know, who went and stole people's resources and also stole their culture and denied them their culture. Because when I, when I was writing my first book, I, I really wanted to include uh, not just other feminists, but an erotic history of sexuality, an erotic history that we have as Arabs that includes poets like Abu Nawas, that includes mm. bisexual and lesbian poets. And Abu Nawas, you know, we now know, you know, wrote love poetry for men and for boys. Mm. And mm. we also know that they were, um, Walada bint al Mustafi wrote um, love poetry for women and men. So she was bisexual. <laughs> And there was there were there were many uh, there was a body of poetry in which women wrote love poems for other women that it has been destroyed sadly by our modern conservatives because they did not want us to have access to that heritage. So whenever someone tells me, you know, this is against our culture, this is this is a an imitation of the West, I tell them to fuck off because this is very much in our culture, and I feel that that through line is through Om Kulsum, regardless mm. of how Om Kulsum identified or didn't during her life. But the reason that Om Kulsum is now kind of that figure for us is because I know now the queer community in so many Arabic speaking countries have embraced Om Kulsum as this queer icon. And when I hear her voice, I feel Egypt in my heart. Mm. I truly She's like the voice of my mother, which is why I want to talk about Um Kulsum and our mothers. Mm. Um Kulsum sounds like my mother, even though my mother is not a singer. My mother is a retired doctor, you know? But I, I hear Um Kulsum and I actually have to look at the speaker. I, I like, it's as if I can mm -hmm. see her. She's Same. speaking to my heart, you know? I stop and I look. It's ridiculous. I'm looking at the speaker, you know? So yeah. when, I, when I hear you talk about Um Kulsum, I, I want to know. Is she also your mother? How does she tie into your mother? Because they're both your mothers, aren't they? Mm, yeah, I mean, it's so beautifully put. I mean, Um Kulthum for me is, is many things, but I think what she transcends is even within current, um, you know, quote unquote homophobic Muslim countries, you know, I have been in rooms and when you watch footage of Um Kalthum back in the day, I've been in rooms and I've watched footage of rooms where this this older sort of quite non-conformist woman is singing and grown patriarchal sort of men of the house are on the floor weeping. It's like temporarily all the societal structures, um, many of them harmful, or, or kind of patriarchal just sort of seem to dissolve for a second and she is she's like a drag mother or she's she's like she's beyond any of the basic men in the room and I think for me when I watched footage of her as a kid it was like I identified with her more than anyone I was sort of anyone in my family or anything like that it was like she's breaking the rules in a way it was like she, she was a rule breaker because she was as, as well from a you know 
very you know as as you know islamic background and she was originally her voice was for singing islamic scripture and all that mm -hmm. but but i just was obsessed with the fact that one woman's expression could almost change everyone's minds for a moment it was like it was like everything just went away when she sang and i and i and for me as well it was like a moment of identification of um it's just so hard to describe i mean i just have such i firstly my mum introduced me to um Kulthum, and i used to wake her up in the middle of the night singing um Kulthum to her i think also the drama of um Kulthum was my first um experience of of camp or mm. of or of of drama you know if you think about like um Kulthum compared to like western greats you know whatever western greats you've got celine dion and they're all iconic and we stand but if you listen to um Kulthum, she sings for 45 minutes mm -hmm. like my heart is bleeding out of my eyes my art you know the level of drama and for me as like a queer kid who was told you know five prayers a day you've got to be really really strict boys don't do this boys don't do that but all of a sudden this woman was so um just melodramatic and embodied it was like it just gave me a lot of hope um and i lip sync to um Kulthum a lot in my shows now to kind of reclaim that idea for her but and also um Kulthum was mine and my mum's secret because my brother i've got a twin brother who's straight um and he didn't care he just wanted to play football with my dad and um Kulthum was like i would learn all the lyrics i would sing it to my mum. it was like a little queer club and i imagine that there must have been so many now i'm realizing like i, I meet queer arabs now and they're like oh yeah um Kulthum, gay mm. icon for me yeah well what do you think it was about her that made her such a gay icon i think it's be probably because she basically said fuck the patriarchy in her own way you know i mean it, it, everything she did broke so many molds now Feminism, you know, ideally feminism would would give those opportunities for everyone. Sadly, Om Kulthum was an exceptional woman. You know, she was an individual who managed to kind of overcome so many of the obstacles that Egyptian society put in the way of women who were her contemporaries. So obviously I would have loved a million Om Kulthums, but knowing all the obstacles that stood in her way and knowing that there was this incredible powerhouse of a woman who stood on a stage with all these men behind her who worshipped her, who adored mm. her. I mean, look at the guy who's playing Oud as he's as he's looking up at her. I mean, he was completely in love with her. Poem, poets, you know, great poets, giants of Arab poetry would beg her to sing their poetry. This this woman was truly a legend, you know. So I think it's it's the fact that she embraced her femininity and combined it with power, and mm. that power subverted so much so much of the patriarchy around her and that power trans um, transferred to the women in the audience because the women could sit there and say ah there's a woman who's powerful and that power also signaled to the men in the audience ah look i'm here and i'm a woman and i am giving you permission because she talked she sang so passionately if we all felt that passion i, I truly believe we would be free I, I believe that she gave the men in the audience permission to feel in a way that the outside world did not. So she, I think she gave power to women who were not allowed to feel that so-called masculine power that they were told only men have. And she gave men permission to feel emotions that they were told only women have. So she does that subversion of gender stereotypes and roles and I think she helped people get out of that prison, you know, that emotions and power are not, uh, don't belong in that prison. Hello? Oops, I think Amra just got, okay. It's just me for now until we wait for Amra to come back. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Remember to send us questions. Click on ask a question at the bottom of the screen. And in a few minutes, I'll take your questions. When Amr is back, I'll chat with him for a bit more. 
and then I'll put your questions to him. I think he will be back very soon. I wish I had some music on right now because I will play some Om Kalsum for you. Actually, until Amber comes back, and I'm sure he will be back very soon, I want to read to you a part of his book that I think truly describes the power of this book. I'll forever remember that night as the precise moment when for the first time, all the different parts of my identity collided. I've spent my whole life feeling like I don't belong. As a queer boy in Islam class, the threat of going to hell because of who I was inside was a very real and perpetual anxiety. Despite being able to leave the Middle East for a liberal Western education that afforded me numerous privileges and opportunities, I faced constant discrimination and prejudice when I won a place at Eton for two years, two of the worst years of my life. I was between the Middle East and London and have felt too gay for Iraqis and too Iraqi for gays. My non-binary gender identity has meant that I don't feel comfortable in most gendered places. Gay male clubs, Hi, instance, I'm sorry, my friend. and I regularly feel out of place in my own male body as it doesn't match up to who I am internally. For a long time, I felt as if I belonged underwater in a marine world with colors to rival the outfits of any RuPaul drag queen with so freely, formlessly, and without judgment, where difference is revealed to be the very fabric of the universe. On land, I felt like a suffocating beached whale, unable to swim to anyone or anywhere. But that Edinburgh night, as the beautiful girl in the hijab held my hand and reassured me of Allah's unconditional love, and I stood in front of her in a sequin leotard and a melting face of sapphire glitter, I finally felt as if I belonged. And here is this wonderful queen Sorry. themselves. Welcome back. My phone just broke, like just turned off. I almost cried. Oh no! Don't worry, we had you. I read a passage from your brilliant yes, book. I, I, I listened to your reading. I should have got you to do the audiobook, Mona. Hi, <laughs> next time. Yeah, next time. Beautifully, re beautifully read. Now I'm thinking that when I read it, um, my audiobook sounded so boring compared to that. You can never be boring, darling. Shut up. You know, I just realized how wonderful your eyebrows are. I was admiring your lipstick, but now your eyebrows, oh my God, they're fucking fabulous. You Thank look you. amazing. Thank you, Shukran. So do you. Um, so I was telling you about Uncle Sum and how she crossed. Yes, I, I listened to that. That was, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, what a queen. Also, like, even holding the handkerchief to cry while she sang. Yes. How how drag is that? I know, so dramatic, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, everything that we said about about her, and, and I want to also connect her to something, and what we're talking about now, to something that you said earlier about um, being reduced to something or, or being held up as tokens, because this is something that I've often fought back against. That And, and you know, you mentioned it beautifully, both in your book and when you were talking earlier. There are problems in Islam. There are problems in various Arab cultures, plural. There isn't one Arab culture. There are numerous Arab cultures. And I think especially when, you know, Iraq had a revolution earlier this year and there were some queer Iraqis who were saying, you know, this is our revolution too. Homophobia. After Sarah died, homophobia. You know, all of this and, and the, what happened in Egypt, that was the reason that she left Egypt. There are serious problems in our religious and cultural backgrounds. And we do not skim over those and we do not pretend. And so what, what I want to talk about now also is one of my biggest challenges now, um, other than telling people to fuck off because I will not do one side against the other because I feel like I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. I'm like, fuck the rock, which is the Islamophobic, racist right wing, and fuck the hard place, which is the misogynist and the homophobes in our quote unquote community. I will tell them both to fuck off. But what I'm seeing now as well is that for many, for many queer people in the Middle East or North Africa or the Arab world, they want nothing to do with Islam because they feel that that is what oppresses them. And then for many queer people outside of the so-called Arab world in the UK or the US, they're holding on to Islam because they don't want to choose between being queer or being Muslim. 
And I think that you and I, and you know, there are several others, it's not just you and me, of course, are this bridge between the two, where we can tell each side, look, we have to talk, because there is this rock and there is this hard place that is going to try to play us off against each other. And we have to reject both. We do not have to acquiesce to either the rock and the hard place. How do you have that conversation? Because I know in your book, you talk about the difficulties of the cultural and religious uh, bigotries, but you also talk about how you fight against discrimination and racism and Islamophobia. What is that place you've created for yourself that is that bridge? Yeah, I mean, it's a really, really well put question. And I think th there are many things that I try and do. I think to anyone who's listening or, you know, to anyone I speak to who is from an Islamic background that is maybe renouncing their faith or is figuring out how to hold into it, hold on to it. What I um, started to, to realize, and I think this is a, a, a kind of a queer approach was um, all organized, fully organized systems of thought that are hierarchical or, you know societal will have a, you know um in if they, they will homogenize or harm us in some way and for me in terms of islam i thought well there was a practice in islam called ijitihad um before it was um kind of the patriarchy got rid of it in islam but it basically said um don't treat the quran as a literal set of commandments it's basically like poems you each discuss your different interpretations of the Quran and you um, come away with what you each come away with, which is what, you know, Sufists really do, where every different Sufist Muslim has their own Allah. There isn't this like one hegemonic Allah. And so for me, it's been about, well, firstly, as the individual, I am going to cherry pick and say, this is a bit that I like. This is a bit that I'm going to say, fuck off. This is the mm -hmm. bit that I like about the West. This is a bit that I'm going to say, fuck off and kind of mm -hmm. inhabit that for myself. So that's like, for me, challenge number one is building my own reality mm -hmm. out of my experiences. And which is why drag is so wonderful because you literally can build your own reality. But then it's connecting with others really and for me in, in London, you know, London queer Muslims, they have ijitihad where you, we literally do do that, where you, um, I haven't gone for a while, but you do, um, a passage from the Quran comes out, everyone has their own interpretation. You discuss it, you fight over it in a, in a lovely way, and you each come away with your own individual takeaway from that. And I think um, the individual but not in like a capitalist selfish way but i think for queer people or disenfranchised minor minorities um deciding what negative thought systems to extricate yourself and building your own healthier ones as an individual so for me one thing was i'm going to use a they pronoun for allah because mm. it's been very negative for me having mm. a him basically mm. watching me every time I go to the loo, every time I have sex, every time I have a slipper upside down. It's like, he's watching me. Ever since I've had Allah as they in my head, whenever they are in my head, because they are, because it's my neurology, it's how I was raised. I'm mm. like, hey, they, I'm a they too. Like, I feel more <laughs> calm around. I feel more calm around them. Now, mm -hmm. if I try to explain that on TV, people, there's no point but that's something that i hold on to myself and sufiist mm -hmm. is sufism is really good for that because actually it tells you you don't need to explain shit to anyone mm -hmm. allah is for you and if allah is an octopus to you i mean he doesn't say that obviously that's what they are to you and that's that so i think it's okay to make your own rules with it um mm -hmm. in terms of that rock in a hard place um you know, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Because there's also so many things about the Middle East that, for instance, the homophobia, hell, mm. right? Absolute hell. Mm. But then when I'm in the UK and I see the way that we treat the elderly in this country, mm. and I think to like 
how horrified I would be to see my BB treated like that and the way the elderly are, are um, there's a kind of much more socialist mentality to family, mm -hmm. to care of your elders in a way in capitalist countries, it's like, whatever, get their useless now, put them in a care home. I go, well, you know, the homophobia is not great there, but there's some wonderful stuff there. And, you know, maybe it's better for gays here, but there's some stuff I don't like. So why don't we all have a conversation of what's good and bad? And I think that what we were talking about earlier, there are pressures from especially mainstream publications and TV going, which side is better? Actually, the episode mm -hmm. I wrote for Apple, which was about mm -hmm. gay Syrians leaving Syria to America, you know, throughout the entire, entire process with Apple and everyone, it says each place is going to be bad and good. Mm. That and you know that took a while because you go wait, but they're leaving this place because it must be shit. And it's like, well, no, they're leaving this place that they love because of some bad shit, mm -hmm. and they're arriving to this quite racist place, but it means they can survive. I don't, yeah. and I think we have to be honest that we're not going. This side is better than that side, or this side is better. Like the world is kind of fucked at the moment, and there's a global revolution's happening. I think we need to unpick unpick every damaging structure and people like you and me i suppose are maybe have a lot of work because we're in the middle of all of them we don't have the privilege of maybe just dealing with racism in the west it's like yeah. we also need to be thinking about this at the same time i don't know what you think i mean i wish i had clearer answers to these but there's just i think we're just at the i think we're like there's just so much digging to be done yeah, no, I, I think everything you said is exactly uh, what I had in mind because I, I, I know that people are torn in the Arab world where they, they want to reject everything that has to do with religion. And it's abs I want to make it clear. It's absolutely everybody's right to leave any religion. This is not me proselytizing. Leave any religion, practice or don't practice. But I know that it seems easier to leave religion. And then in in the so-called West, it's like this, uh, because of so much racism and Islamophobia, um, people feel, again, this tokenistic kind of approach to it, where they have to defend Islam against, you know, white people or people who hate Islam. And, and so they, they hold on to it even more. And it's just like, and I want everyone to be free and complicated. I want mm. everyone to believe whatever they want to believe or whatever they don't want to believe, but also to be free of all of these oppressions, which leads us beautifully to that global revolution. Because, you know, in the United States is this incredible moment right now of revolution, Black-led revolution, you know, started by this movement called Black Lives Matter that was started in 2013 by three queer black women. And it's so important to remember that this was a movement began by three queer black women. There's a reason that mm. this global revolution right now was big, well, is thanks to a movement that three queer black women began. Because when you think of a queer black woman, she, she or they are at the intersection of all of those things that we're talking about. Because we are fighting cis, hetero, capitalist, imperialist patriarchy a kind of the system of oppression, oppressions plural, that will not allow us to exist in all of this complication. Because if there's intersectionality in feminism, there's intersectionality in oppressions. Mm. So I would like us to kind of plug into this moment right now, recognizing that anti-blackness exists in the United States, exists in the UK, and exists in the various Arab countries that we talk about when we talk about the Arabic speaking countries in the Middle East and North Africa. So there is anti-blackness that we have to unpack. There is colorism, there is capitalism, there is police brutality, there is homophobia, there is misogyny, ableism, ableism all of so this is basically a revolution that we all can plug into. Well, so I think yes, that the, because, your, sorry. and your publication comes in right now is perfect. So speak to me about this revolutionary moment. Yeah, well, I mean, it is a revolutionary moment and one thing that i hope that starts to happen is that everyone begins to connect the dots because i feel like people think of issues as 
separate from one another. And what's happening in the UK, I don't know if, who, who's from the UK here, but in the UK, we have a particularly bad um, transphobic press. Even the left wing press is very transphobic. Um, mm -hmm. Britain is like, I, I have trans friends who are literally claiming asylum in New Zealand because Britain right now is so transphobic. And the reason being is because Britain has never ever addressed its class problem and has never addressed um, colonialism, and we don't get taught colonialism in the UK. Literally, everyone thinks colonialism is a gorgeous period drama on the BBC, and literally, we get taught about it as the British Museum. We got all these great treasures from the world, and it was wonderful. Now, <laughs> there's an anti racist conversation that's happening because of Black Lives Matter here in the UK, but at the same time, there is a really a lot of the people who are part of that conversation, sort of white cis feminists mm -hmm. who are fighting racism, are the ones writing articles, you know, in The Guardian, in New Statesman, wherever, saying trans women are going to come and destroy us all. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's a really important time and it's a lot of work for, for trans and non-binary people of colour who are getting so much shit to mm -hmm grab this moment to show that racism and transphobia are both part of a colonial legacy of mm -hmm. binary sex and also racial inferiority. It comes from scientific classifications, but also um, that um, transphobia, and it's no surprise, every major transphobic feminist in the UK is a white cisgender middle-class woman who has a lot of privilege and says, well, I've suffered some misogyny, but now I'm successful. So instead mm -hmm. of now um, going after the patriarchy, which I'm basically benefiting from now because they've allowed me in in some way, mm -hmm. I'm going to punch down at trans people. So that's what's going on in the UK. And it's like, if we look at what's happening in America with the death of black trans women, it's mm -hmm. all so connected. And this is what I think really this moment is about of, um is this kind of connecting the dots and you know my book is just one example of trying to just um explore the complexity of intersectionality of going you know i'm too gay for arabs but too arab for gays and this means this and homophobia is here but then my you know and as you know having an intersectional identity is like it ebbs and flows at some point suddenly you're like wow i'm getting a lot of racism but my sexuality is like accepted and now it's not and but we need to start understanding how they are all part of the same system of oppressions. And I hope what this moment doesn't become is, well, I think we've had a great conversation about racism, cool, where it's like, we need to understand this intersection with everything else. And it's yeah. hard work, but, but that's what I think this moment is. Absolutely. And this is exactly why I think that your book is so important, Amr, because, you know, in the United States right now, black feminists, are saying, you know, and, and this was obvious to me in Egypt, it's obvious to me here in the United States, it's obvious in what you just said. So I'm saying too, that there is no liberation without queer liberation, gender liberation, sexual liberation, and that this cannot be, this revolutionary moment cannot be about one group of cisgender heterosexual men fighting the system, fighting mm. systemic racism, just for the sake of black men. Now, black men face incredible, horrific police brutality, but so do cis black women, so do trans women, so do non-binary people, so do trans men. And we've seen names of people from all of those communities. There are black, there was a black trans man, there have been several black trans women, and also um, cis women who have died because of police brutality. And if the revolution isn't about them, then this is not a revolution because no. the revolution has to dismantle. And, and this is the point where your book begins and ends with this patriarchy, because this at the end of the day is about patriarchy. And your book begins in the introduction with these women from Saudi Arabia who come to your show, to your drag show in Edinburgh and at first you're very worried. Well, I'm gonna let, let you tell the story. And it ends with a conversation with your mother. And it, so you basically bookend with patriarchy. So tell us a bit about 
that conversation with the Saudi women and then your mother and what patriarchy means for you and, and the importance of bringing patriarchy into the conversation. Sure, Doctor. I've just seen, by the way, Mona, that we've got quite a few questions coming in. Oh, I see them now, yeah. Okay, well, I was waiting for them to come in. You speak and I'll go look at the questions. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I think for me, um, what bookends the book is, you know, at the beginning, I was doing this, this really sort of subversive drag show about Islam and there were six Saudi women in the front row in hijabs watching the show. And I assumed that they were there to punish me for what I was doing because what I was doing was so sinful in my head. I was taught, wow, they're going to hate me. It was so dramatic for me because I just thought, you know, I had a, a room of white people who were laughing because they were feeling really progressive and, oh, wow, look at this Muslim drag queen we're watching. But these six Muslim women were looking at me very stoically and I just thought, why are they here? But at the end of the show, when they came to talk to me, the you know the mother was fully covered up, and they were like, "We we loved that because we recognized something." You know, you've we've but we've recognized that because in the show that I sing a love song to Allah, screaming at him for kind of basically like abusing me as a lover for a while, mm -hmm. and they said, "You know, we got that. Like, we don't necessarily agree with we all your." views on religion or whatever but we're women in Saudi Arabia and we felt that and it was amazing because I just thought well you're Muslim and I just basically put a dildo in my ass while singing about Allah in front of like 800 people whatever it is and but but you recognize that we were both fighting something and at the end of the book me and my mom both have a conversation we have a conversation about um um you know my mom says you know I'm jealous of you basically Amru because I'm trapped as a woman in the Middle East and you live three nights a week as a woman this is what she said I was quite reductive but it was interesting and you feel free and I had to say well no I don't actually feel free because of all this other shit and it was like the first time my mum wasn't my enemy it was like we've both suffered because you're dealing with male oppression in the Middle East, I'm dealing mm. with all this other shit. And mm. even though we disagree, we can agree that the system that's made us fight so much is the thing that's the problem. Yeah, yeah exactly. Be thank you, because it's patriarchy. And who benefits from patriarchy? It's basically cisgendered, heterosexual, wealthy, conservative, able-bodied, upper class men mm, and you know not even all of them and the rest of us are fucked. Right. So now that we've dealt with patriarchy, we're coming for you patriarchy, <laughs> going to questions now and I and we have quite a few. So I'm here we go. The first one is from Dana and Dana says, loves, I want to know as a straight Arab woman who is also a documentary producer and journalist, what can I do better? What stories need to be amplified that don't just highlight the traumas, but also celebrate queer identities? I love that question because we both talked when we began Amr in the green room about we want hope and joy. We don't want to be stuck in a moment of trauma. Take it away. I agree. Yeah, beautifully put. I think as a I mean, documentary, I've only ever made one short documentary, but one thing that I think um, is to find subjects and let them tell their stories so that um you know i've seen ba bad documentaries about kind of arab minorities where there's this sense that the documentary person is passing a judgment on their life or it looks like they're gazing and i i often find like one of my favorite documentaries who's going to love me now which is about a, a gay man trying to reconnect with his jewish family um it's the documentary lets him do all the work about his life and because it's so authentically him no one who even has a hard life i think talks about their life as it's hard they live the nuances of it and the nuances will have joy and comedy so i feel like finding subjects and letting their complexity do the work is what will help you um amplify these lives as three-dimensional joyful ones um that's what i think i think let let them tell their story excellent thank you and next question is from abdul rahman 
Abdul Rahman said, Munna and Amr, do you think there's hope one day queer people will be accepted in the, in the MENA region, especially Egypt, because this is where the topic is very hot nowadays? If yes, how will change come? You answer that one, I think. Oh. <laughs> okay, very quickly, because I want to hear more from you that, than, than me, Amr. Um, Abdul Rahman, I'm so glad that you're watching from Egypt. Ahlan wa zahlan. I'm so glad you're here. And I fully, honestly believe in this. So 10 years ago in Egypt, in, two, in, in 2010, a young man called Khalid Saeed was killed by Egyptian police. And Khalid Saeed became a catalyst for the revolution in Egypt in 2011. I fully, and in 2010, there was a man called Mohammed Bouazizi who set himself on fire in Tunisia and became the, cap the catalyst to the revolution in Tunisia and ignited the, the revolutions across the region. I honestly believe 10 years later now, because it's now 10 years later, that the name Sarah Hagazi will be the name that will spark the queer revolution. Not in Egypt right now, because there are no protests in Egypt right now, because we live under a fascist fuck called Abdel Fattah Sisi, who is supported by another fascist fuck called Donald Trump. However, because of this, because we can connect like this, because of social media, in the same way that social media helped people connect before the Egyptian revolution, social media is helping queer people connect now. And I fully believe that the name Sarah Hegezi will be remembered as a turning point in Egypt and in the Middle East and North Africa for all of us queer people to say, no one will be free. There is no revolution without queer revolution. There is no liberation without queer liberation. It is difficult in Egypt right now, if not outright impossible, because all this existence is underground. But if you go on social media every day, there is a vigil for Sara, and there are openly queer Egyptians and Arabs attending these vigils. Watch these vigils and understand that that is the revolution. Hmm. Do you want to add anything to that, Am? That was so beautifully put that I, I think we should leave it. I mean, I, one thing I will say is there's this wonderful line from Angels in America, which says, progress is painful. It's like two steps forward, five steps back, eight steps forward. Um, I think the revolution will come because this new generation of, of younger people will not take no for an answer. I really do feel that. I think the revolution will be messy but i do think it will come i feel it i really feel it yes yes and it will come because of you and because of me and because of everyone who is attending right now and all the vigils next question is from i don't see a name so whoever um said this thank you mona and Am, during pride month a time when we're supposed to come together how do we navigate structural racism and colorism within our community a reality that often gets brushed under the carpet also who or what are you listening to or reading and watching right now uh, that inspires or gives you hope ah this is from alex in chicago thank you for that alex in chicago um how do you navigate structural racism and colorism within our community um it's a complicated one because like i as someone who like is on, on the receiving end of it it can be quite hard to sort of i mean what i try and do is this is work for me because i found that because of a lot of the porn i consumed in the uk it was quite racist the way that like white and brown bodies had sex together or all the hot guys tended to be white and the, the the poc guys were like really thrown to the side or they were used as primitive mm -hmm. um sort of tools so i i know some queer porn makers who really work to decolonize porn mm -hmm. so that i'm almost retraining my sexual desire so that mm -hmm. i'm not immediately thinking "Ooh, i need to have sex with a white guy because that's what's hot because that is what I used to think when I was much, much younger mm. for all the reasons that we talked about. So I've tried to do work on decolonizing my own desire. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, I mean, and when, when I get racial microaggressions in sex, like, and I get them all the time still, I now make it, I do just say, why are you saying that? Let's deconstruct it if I have the energy, but you don't have to have the energy. And if you just want to say you're blocked, I don't want to deal with this, it's mm -hmm. fine. 
I have to say my life got like a hundred times better the less white people I slept with just because I wasn't as aware of that. Mm-hmm. I still sleep with white people, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a fully rounded answer to that because the problem is there's a, a lot of white gays because they're gay think, oh, I've done my mm-hmm. bit of oppression. So they don't know they're being racist a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and so more stories, more characters on TV where we see POC queer people just being like the white queers are always on TV. I think we'll slowly start to deconstruct that racism. Yeah, yeah. Great. And what are you listening to and reading to right now or oh, reading to reading right now that is helping you in this moment? I mean, I, I'm i weirdly comforted by the truth. I know that sounds silly, but like, um, because as people of color, like we're, and queer people were gaslit all the time. Racism's not real. Mm-hmm. I get that all the time. Or is it not in your head? I like to read books at the moment that just lay it out. My book that I'm reading at the moment, I've just got it here, is, um, well, I'm rereading it for the second time, is uh, the, Re- the Return of Race Science, which is by Angela Saini. It's called Superior. And it is... <laughs> It is literally like a scientific anatomical discussion of how scientists through colonialism and all that invented the idea of racial superiority. Mm. And it and it and it debunks racism's lie. Um, mm. And in a way, it's an uncomfortable read, but to see it there scientifically on the page, like, yes, this is how it happened. It's almost like I've seen the monster in a way and Grey's Anatomy when I really can't be fucked just because it's so <laughs> silly and I just forget. What about you, Mona? <laughs> well, you know, um, I, I compiled um, a list of uh, books by black feminists that I will post on Twitter after we finish our conversation. And I'll, I'll try and put a screen grab on Instagram as well. And I've also compiled a list which includes your book, Amri, your wonderful book, of um, LGBTQ books by people from MENA or people of Arab descent uh, oh, that okay. also on, on Twitter. And I, I, I turn to those books again and again because of this revolutionary moment. And in recognition, you know, like, you know because we're, we're like in, in North America, we're like three months into the pandemic, but there is a pandemic. And, you know, right now it's the revolution we were talking about, but there is a pandemic. And it's important to remember that this is a pandemic that has disproportionately killed and affected the most marginalized people. And that's exactly why we have this revolution. And it's so important. So, so I, in, in to honor that, I am seeking out books by people who, who say that we are the most marginalized communities and we are the ones that fall at the intersection of all of these oppressions that have targeted us because of the, the pandemic. So black feminists and queer authors. And Mona's books, I have to say, Seven Deadly Sins just came out in the UK. I've been telling all my thank friends you. to read it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, and um, be, you know, we could do this love fest forever, but I'm gonna go and get another question now because um, your fans want to know more. So next question. Thank you, Alex, for that. Um, would you consider writing a YA novel? With previous experience in that end of the industry, I never saw a drag novel that truly lit up my heart in the way live drag does. The scene you described of stumbling on Pride of Arabia just gave me chills, though. And are there any lessons from your own drag journey and this memoir that you think would translate for the youth today? And that is from Hannah Masarik. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Um... Firstly, I would like to make a recommendation for a black queer author who wrote a drag YA no- novel. His name is Dean Atta. It's called The Black Flamingo. Um, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous YA novel, um, which is all about the kind of intersection of, of um, you know, heritage and queerness. So I just would really like to shout that out. Um, f- for now, it's a really beautiful book. Um, would I write a YA novel? Um, I mean, potentially, I mean, th- are there any lessons from your drag journey in this memoir that you think would translate? I think, um, I mean, I am, I mean, Unicorn has been optioned for TV and I and I hope that, you know, y- 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 younger, 
well hopefully it'll get made but like i think what i um want to show through unicorn in the book on whatever screen it will take is how the fight to be true to yourself is a constantly um changing and challenging journey and um and what drag journey in this moment so for me drag and what i really would like um to ex what i like to see in drag representation on screen is i think what you see especially from drag race it's like as a boy i'm like this and then in drag i'm woo this empowered queen but actually drag your drag character itself is always changing and informing your personality and identity out of drag so for me initially when i started doing drag it was like well i was only dressing up as a white woman basically and was in my early 20s and drag for me was like i would literally stay on stage fuck islam and fuck god and i'm a badass bitch but it was like fun but it was a little bit inauthentic because i was only exploring one side of myself but it was still great and fun and i was really happy for that phase but then when mm -hmm. i reconnected with my mother and other queer people from the MENA region, I was bringing Um Kulthum into my drag and then actually reconnecting with my faith and my heritage through drag. So I think like what you see on Drag Race is just like, drag is this zero sum game where you're just in drag and you're iconic, but actually the drag space is, play, is like this fantasy land where you can just test things out. So for me, my relationship with Allah is something that I do in drag all the, all, all the time. Like I perform, I sing on stage. It feels like a mosque. I wear an abaya and I sing to Allah some things that I wanted to say to them as a child. Like, why do you want to fuck me five times a day? That's what I used to say. Why this? Or, or actually I'm kind of obsessed with you because of this. And it teaches me stuff. So it's not just this like, it's a place to explore your identity in a slightly separate place it's almost like you live at, it's like living in a film for a bit where you get to write a new narrative and test it out so that's mm -hmm. what i would say excellent thank you okay next question uh, this is quite long so i'm i'm gonna read it to like the beginning of it because i think it will give you the gist of it because i just want to spend uh, more I can time read it on here it. actually do you want me to, you want I me to read it? It. fabulous okay um can everyone see it on the questions if everyone looks at it um uh, after what happened to sarah you do yeah, you want to read on, it actually no, no no go ahead after what happened to sarah um uh, mona Haider made a story saying that there is a growing islamophobia among the men of queer community and called such people colonized in their brain and orientalists my question is in parallel what's happening to black people where some white people attack black people for being violent sometime when they ask for their rights but at the same time, white people would never do anything to tackle racism. It is always black people who have to do the job. Don't you think queer issues are mainly straight Muslim issues and they should also be doing the work? Why always get mad at queer people from Mena region who, who turn Islamophobic sometimes when barely any straight Muslim person is in the front fighting for gay Arab queers? Can't we turn the question around and tell straight Muslims, why don't you stop do something for fellow queers would stop hating their roots so much? I'm talking from my own experience. I'm queer and from Morocco, ex-Muslim, but it always frustrates me how the same people who never defend queers would be the first ones to defend Islam. By Muhammad Abu Zain. I think that's beautifully put. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I do agree that um, um, there is this... So I think with Islam as well, like I've noticed, firstly, in the West, a lot of people who are anti-gay and anti-trans go all of a sudden when they want to say islam is evil they say because they're so bad to gay and trans people and i say like what the fuck like you have literally been awful to gay and trans people your whole life but now it's convenient for you because it's used for islam and you know and then again vice versa where um maybe some people are, are saying to, to queer people are oh, you're really really islamophobic but they're not acknowledging their own homophobia. And I'd say it's all what Mona has been saying about this revolution happening in multiple spaces at the same time. It has to be an intersectional revolution because Islamophobia will decrease if homophobia decreases in the Middle East. It just will because 
that anti-Islam sentiment will decrease as well and vice versa. So it all benefits everyone. That's what I hate about in fighting between minority groups where it's, I only want to talk about race and not this, mm -hmm. or feminists who literally say in the UK, there are white feminists who say we shouldn't be talking about race because mm -hmm. we'll forget the discussion about women's bodies. And it's like, mm -hmm. if you don't understand racism, your bodies will always be oppressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, so I think we need to get out of selfish activism. Like for me, for instance, like, yeah, I want to concentrate on queerness, but if I'm not also concentrating on everything else, then my queerness will never fully be accepted. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Am. And here's one more question. I'll read this one because it's very quick. Hello, y'all. I just want to know how to have a healthy conversation with my parents about being queer and how can I deal with homophobes and bullies without compromising my identity? Love from Egypt, D. Thank you, D, from tuning in from Egypt. Take it away, Am. Look, you know, it's different for everybody. And thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I, firstly, with the homophobes and bullies, like I, I can't, I don't um, have an answer for you there just because I was so badly bullied. Um, but I will say that, my God, all the people who bullied me now, when I look at their lives, they're so deeply tragic and just basic and I feel so empowered and um, special people do get bullied. Um, in terms of how to deal with them, um, for me, but I was able to do this in the UK, so there was a sense of privilege there. I don't know what your situation is. You know, for me, it was if someone said, oh, look at you, you're so gay. I'd say, yeah, I'm so gay. Do you want your do you, you, do you want your dick sucked? That was what I used to do. And then they were like, oh, well, you're kind of making fun of yourself now. So we're going to back off. I don't know what situation you're, for your, for your, you're in. With your parents, look, I have a very tricky time with my parents. Um, and I don't know what the repercussions would be for you. But what I would say is, is can you write it i mean for me it always helps to write because i'm a writer but to write the to write them a letter even maybe when you've left home or something which explains it because when when you're having a face to face conversation like this sometimes i find it can get quite heated and where you can just explain it and have the time and give them time to process it i don't want to give you advice for you to do and then it go horribly wrong um but it does really get better and even if it goes wrong, I, as in they don't accept you like happened to me or the bullies are terrible, there's light at the end of the tunnel, is all I can say. Thank you, Al. We have one last question here. This is from Shahd in Egypt. Hey, lovelies, wondering if you know of any secret Facebook groups for queers or, or, or are struggling to connect with, oh, I am struggling to connect with that community beyond the few amazing queer Arabs I follow on Instagram. Love, Shahd, Egypt. I don't know the answer to that. I know, um, and I wouldn't want to say them out loud just because of their privacy. Um, but Sam, if you find me on Instagram and send me a DM, I can link you up to a queer Egyptian and they might be able to direct you to some. So it's not on a public forum, but I would, I do check my DMs. So, so definitely, definitely message me on Instagram at Glamru. Um, and I, I can hopefully link you up with somebody. Excellent. Thank you, Amru, for that. Well, we have been talking for an hour and 18 minutes and it oh feels God. like 10 minutes and I would love to talk to you forever. Me too, my <laughs> but love. Before we let you go, um, it's really important that for everyone here in, in this room, because I feel like we're in a room even though we can't all see each other, I want to end by stressing the importance of joy and living and being here and existing, not just in the face of this awful pandemic that has taken so many, not just in the face of systemic racism and anti-blackness and police brutality and the brutality of capitalism, but also the brutality of homophobia and transphobia and all the phobias that we deal with. 
because the biggest revolution and the biggest celebration is the one that says, fuck you, I'm here, I survived, and I am not going anywhere. So I want us to celebrate our existence. If there was one thing, one song, one poem, one thing that for you represents that joy, what would it be? So I can go and turn it on right now and just dance before I take my sequins off. For me, um, I'm trying to, th um, it's not really a, I mean, for me, it's not really a, I know this sounds so, so silly, but it's very strange, but I have this one um, image in my head of when I was like 24, and things were very very complicated at home i think my parents were like we got we had the worst row ever they said i was the biggest disappointment of their life they were so i, I ruined my mum's life she said to me and it was horrible and you know and then we fell out and then a photo of me in drag went around the community and it was just really bad and then i was um that night had a show and i just couldn't be bothered but then backstage one of my drag sisters just did my makeup kind of quite silently and, and said something funny and it was like oh i feel completely healed right now and i'm with you and whenever i feel really scared or alone i always just remember how i felt backstage with her doing my makeup i think she farted and it was all a bit lame and it was like <laughs> it was like there you it was just like and I often just breathe that image in if I feel incredibly scared. So I have, for me, it's images in my head that I hold on to. That's what I have. I don't know about you, Mona. I love that. Well, you know, I put on blue glitter eyeshadow. Mm -hmm. And coincidentally, you're wearing blue. <laughs> so I love that. So it's also about you know, makeup and dressing up, it, it like sequins and and all of that. And I and it's and it can be as silly as possible, but it's just so so important that we hold okay. on to that joy because there are so many things that want to kill us and yeah. that. Joy. And so I want everyone watching. Someone Abdul Rahman was just asking right now, what is your handle on Instagram? And it's Glamru Abdul Rahman. It's I'll, write, I'll write it. I'll write it for you. I'll write it down. Yeah, write it. So I just want everyone who came today to know that we are holding you. This is a virtual holding, obviously. But I'm so glad that you joined us. I'm so glad that you spent this one hour and twenty-two minutes with us. Thank you for your time. Your time is precious, and you are precious, and your lives are precious. And I'm such a wonderful and comrade in this revolution to be special you and too, my love you so I'm, I, you're all my love and solidarity with you because we are comrades in this revolution together yes we are i love i love you thank you this has been such a wonderful wonderful thank you so much for taking the time to to speak with me and and you're the best honestly i've had the best time and i feel I loads have... of hope i hope you all feel hope and you feel fire to carry on Yes, I hope so too. And you know, Amr is there and I'm here. Follow each other on Instagram. Find us. Know that you are not alone and find your joy. Love you, Shukran. I love you, Amr. Love you all. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. This was, I mean, oh, what did we do? Absolutely wonderful. So thank you, everyone. I can't hear you. Oh. I think Samantha's saying thank you. It was wonderful. Right. It's like 1.30 here, so I'm going to fall asleep. But that was amazing, Mona. Thank you so much. I owe you big time. That was wonderful. My pleasure. My absolute pleasure. One of these days, we will have a drink together and say, fuck the patriarchy. With Amna, <laughs> With Amna as well. With Amna, I would love that. Right. Love you, Shukran. Are we still online? Yes. No, I think it's just the green room. No, nope. is it alive? <laughs> no, we're still online. So I want everyone to know that I always end these events by saying as a group, fuck the patriarchy. So on the count of three, 
We will say fuck the patriarchy and you will all type fuck the patriarchy, okay? One, two, three. Fuck, fuck the patriarchy. The patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lol. Um, bye, everybody. See you later. Bye, bye everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm Amra's book. Thank you so much, Mona. Thank you, Samantha. Take care. Take care. <laughs>